We're now going to get right into a very free-flowing open question time. So uh, let's uh, move. There are already a forest of hands here. So uh, microphone number one down at the... Oh, it's going, uh, it's going up to the top of the back there. Uh, I'm John Karen uh, from Connecticut. Uh, the Iraq war is a big issue in this, uh, in this country, in the pre presidential campaign. There's uh, one candidate says we should uh, stay the course until we win. The other two say should, we, should, uh, we should get out. Uh, in the meantime, we have this, this problem that uh, our presence, our occupation of Iraq is uh, inflaming the Muslim world. Uh, the, the terrorism are headquartered in uh, uh, Pakistan and Iraq. So in the meantime, though, we're use, losing U.S. lives and we're spending $2, million, $2 billion a week. So the question is, uh, what would happen if we got out? And then if the reply is, well, we can't get out because there's so much chaos. So the second question is, well, uh, when can we get out? Okay. So that we can address this problem of uh, we got this $2 billion that we can't spend on urgent domestic issues of, of uh, okay. health care. Uh, two questions there. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, it's a question that many people have asked me. Uh, are we going to cover that one? Who wants to jump in with an answer here? <laughs> <laughs> or at least who wants to be first? Ellen? Sure. Um, well, I think that we will have a choice to make in November between one candidate who believes that America's credibility and integrity require us to stay as long as the job is needed, and the Iraqis are not, including Iraqis in power, are not yet ready to say, please leave now, uh, even though I think Iraqis themselves have a very conflicted feeling. They want us to leave, they want us to stay at the same time. Okay, so we have one candidate who's going to say, that it really is about America's integrity and credibility and that um, we should finish the job. And this would resonate, I think, with many professional military, et cetera. But the other candidates, I think, feel very much the pulse of the American people that we can't turn this into a victory. We cannot, this is never going to feel good. This is never going to have a really happy ending for the United States or for the Iraqis. And the logic there would be, why don't we begin to think about the end game. And I do think that's where a critical mass of the public are in their thinking. But I'm not imagining that a new president who thinks the Iraq war has to be put into the past can walk away very quickly. It's not just what will the Iraqis do the day we leave. It's literally how to get the US military out of the country. Uh, this is not something that one you don't move 100,000 plus troops with all the support <coughs> services, et cetera, out very quickly. So I'm imagining that we're talking about probably a one to two year process uh, that would have to be managed carefully with the Iraqis. And there will still be a residual American presence, I think, after that. The negotiations that are going on between Washington and Baghdad now about um, a security agreement that would, that would govern after the UN resolution has expired in September that would govern the status of American forces in Iraq will be an opportunity to define what would be a more modest American presence that would contribute perhaps to training and to security for us, as well as security for at least some part of the Iraqi system. Um, but I think the Iraqis have a lot of work to do to get ready for that, for that transition. But that's, I think that's the most likely scenario, a one to two year process where we reduce the American presence down to probably somewhere in the range of 30 to 50,000 American troops. Okay, anyone else on the panel? Ren? <laughs> this is a dangerous subject to talk about. Uh, but I would like to, I know it's a very emotional subject, uh, but I would like to take it a little bit beyond the emotions and look at it strategically and from the point of view of American interests. And I think what is important, really, is not setting a timetable and saying, well, we need to get out in a year or two years or six months or, f or, or 100 years. Uh, but it's really more a question about what are US strategic interests in, the re in Iraq and in the region? How are US strategic interests and security interests uh, best served and best preserved what are we doing in order to preserve them and secure them over the long term? Mm 
is that achievable if we draw down our troops within a year or within a two years, or do we need to keep troops for a somewhat longer period of time? And the converse question is, what are the consequence, consequences to US interests and to US security if we do decide to pull out in a year or two, or any time frame that you wish to, uh, to, to define, to identify? I think those really are the core questions uh, even though uh, I, uh, the emotional issues are very important. I have to say that, uh, having just come back from Iraq, uh, both ordinary citizens and Iraqi policymakers uh, have said to me, first of all, the issue of bases, by the way, and, and the story about staying 100 years is, is nonsense. It's not, not going to fly. Uh, so we've sort of come back short of that. And the realistic response from policymakers, and, and truly from regular citizens, is that we still feel that we are a fragile state. We are, the state was shattered in 2003, and we're building it up from the ground up. We're not there yet. We have uh, terrorists, we have insurgents, we live in a neighborhood where our uh, neighbors are eager to meddle in our affair affairs. We still are not capable of handling all those security issues on our own. And therefore, we need a cool-headed <coughs> policy about US military presence. This is what I've heard from Iraqis. Let me uh, make a comment. Um, I think uh, Senator McCain uh, was being a little hyperbolic. I'm supporting him, so I'm going to just truth and consequence here. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 but I think his comment was that we should not, uh, in a political campaign, make a decision that could have profound effect for both the Iraqi people and for us in the Middle East based on uh, campaign slogans. And I agree with him on that. Uh, one of the problems with international development generally, not just Iraq, and with state building. I don't like the word nation building because none of us are engaged in nation. We're in, engaged in state building in Bosnia, in um, Kosovo. Uh, Francis Fukuyama has written some very good uh, works distinguishing between state building, bil building the apparatus of a government, and building a, a nation state, which is uh, a set of values and share. It takes 100 years, 200 years to, say, to, to build a state, and there's only one or two examples in the last thousand years of anybody from the outside ever building a state. I mean, building a, a, a nation, nation. We're building, we're doing state building. And, and it's, it's Republicans and Democrats doing it in both administrations. We've engaged in it. And there are three things we know from all the empirical research. Rand did an excellent study on it, my own research and my own experience over 18 years. Number one, it takes a long time to do it. It takes 10 or 15 years to establish a functioning democracy. I am a big advocate of democracy. I'm not uh, a realist and who says, you know, uh, most people in the developing world who I talk to want some control over the government that's in their country. And they want the protection of human rights. I have never met anyone say, we don't want any human rights in our country. It's usually the people committing the atrocities or the abuses who say that. The common people all want some kind of protection. I don't think we should be naive about transferring the American system because doesn't always work very well here. I'm always appalled at some of the things we try to transfer abroad from the United States that are dysfunctional here. Why would we want to send them? Like our campaign consultants from Demo the Democratic and Republican parties, we send them abroad to work in other campaigns. Lock them up here. Don't send them abroad, please, for heaven's sake. But, but they all want some control, and they want stability, and they, they want protection. And I understand that. But it takes a long time to do it. So when my party says we can do this in two years with you know, quarterly indicators, I'm not, I guess I'm being sarcastic, utterly ridiculous. It takes a long time to do it. So patience, which we don't have in this country, is very important in state building, and it's very important in Iraq. The second thing we need is consistent long-term funding, not just for uh, a military presence. And that's, you know, sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's multinationalism in Bosnia. Our troops are still in Bosnia, when I say that, the international troops. 
They're still there. The, the Bosnian civil war ended 10 years ago. If we withdrew too, many, too quickly from Bosnia, there would be instability. But it is becoming more stable. I was shocked when I visited there two years ago how different it is than it was in the middle of the war when I was there in the NGO community in the mid-90s. So the second thing is we need funding for 10 to 15 years, development funding, to support the building of, of democratic institutions through the Iraqi government. You know, they have to, it's, it's gotta be part of, they gotta own this and lead it. And that's the most important, that's the third thing we've learned. If there's no local leadership, all of this fails. All of this fails. We, our job is to help local leaders who own their own development and their own the political development, social development, economic development, and make the decisions and to support them technically. Uh, but it's their country. It is their country. We can't go in arrogantly and say, because there's no, we've also learned, I guess, a fourth thing, which is there is no template that's like quantum mechanics, you know, where, the, where it works everywhere in the universe. I'm not even sure quantum mechanics, I'm not a scientist, but I know that state building can, does not have a template that works everywhere. It's different in different countries. Some things work, some things do not work. Some things work all the time, some th things work very seldom. I mean, in terms of different sectors and different approaches. We, are, we still are going through in the aid uh, and World Bank and the UN agencies to see which things are appropriate for Iraq and which the Iraqis want. But I have to say, I think there's a huge potential for a very stable middle-class democracy, sort of like what Korea has become. In, but it's going to take a while to do it. And just saying we're going to leave, I, I, think, I think it's unethical to do it. Even if you oppose the war, just all of a sudden leaving uh, doesn't make any sense to me at all. <coughs> Scott? Uh, let me just build briefly on that very last point. Um, <clears throat> it, it's uh, <clears throat> realpolitik is one thing. There's also something called moralpolitik. And sometimes they, and more often than they do, they should be seen together. That is, what is the ethical question here? <clears throat> And um, I'm going to channel Brian Hayer a bit, or if not Brian, uh, Jerry Powers, my colleague at Notre Dame, who uh, worked with Brian in the U.S. bishops for 17 years and has the cover article in the current issue of America, and he makes this argument. He doesn't believe, and I agree with him, that, that Iraq was a just war, to use that ethical category. The criteria that Brian laid out or referred to for a just war weren't in place when we invaded. But that's one issue. We're in there now. And the criteria of jus post bellum, that is, after the war, um, is which Michael Walter, the ethicist, has written about. Now that we're in there, what are the ethical obligations? A lot of our discourse politically, and even we've mentioned it today, understandably, talks about US interest, US strategic interests. Well, ethically, we're obliged to consider Iraqi interests as well as US interests. And it's... <clears throat> It's not necessarily the case that they're mutually opposed in every respect. Although, as someone else mentioned, we have our own ethical conundrums in the way this war and the occupation has been uh, waged in terms of burdening a small uh, percentage of the population. That's an ethical issue for us as well as we go forward. Who's going to pay the price? So um, I think we do have to think about the ethical obligations in bringing what the ethicists would call a just peace or a resolution. The tagline of this was Colin Powell, you know, if you break it, you own it. And right now we own it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have two Andrews on the panel. And if you bear with me, I'm always going to say Andrew <clears throat> Natsios or Andrew Preston. And we're going to move to Andrew Preston now. Well, just very briefly, um, from an international perspective, obviously the war was extremely unpopular and did a lot of damage to um, America's reputation around the world. And I think American foreign policy will have to deal with that. Um, for a long time to come, but when um, America does come to withdraw from Iraq, whether it's shortly after the, uh, this year's election or maybe longer term, it's got to be done in a way, um, sort of building on what Scott and others have been saying, it's got to be done in a way where there's uh, no chaos, it can't be done uh, quickly so that, um, so that there's a repeat of what happened in 2003 with the rioting and the looting and, and reprisals and, and so on and so forth, because what will do more, even more damage to America's uh, reputation, especially its moral reputation, is if there's a quick pullout um, and that Iraq is even uh, worse um, off than it, was, uh, than it was before. Thank you. Uh, we have a question now from Portland, so that will come up on our screen here. 
and I'm going to just read it. Uh, it seems clear that a sophisticated religious literacy should be a basic job qualification for American foreign policy and development professionals. <coughs> what are your recommendations for ensuring that this sort of retraining happens? <laughs> Doug, yeah. thank well, you for taking that question. Uh, uh, there is no money for any training in AID left. They won't give it any money for operating expenses or staff. There are 3,000 foreign service offices in AID, and I ran AID for five years, one of my favorite <laughs> institutions and jobs in my career. Uh, in 1980, we had 3,000 foreign service offices. In 1990, we had 2,000, and we have 1,000 now. Mm -hmm. That is a disaster. When they asked for, Rumsfeld kept, Secretary Rumsfeld kept saying during, why aren't you sending your staff? I said, I have 10% of my staff in Iraq and Afghanistan. He said, you do? How many staff do you have? I said, 1,000 foreign service officers. Your army bands are bigger than the entire AID foreign service. <laughs> Which is ridiculous. Okay. It's ridiculous. Can we move to Doug to yes. take that question? <laughs> you know, Andrew's on my board, so he can talk as long as he wants. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you have to excuse me. I have to take a little bit of license here because at the break, I dutifully swore to Mike Stein from Belfast that uh, he said there are a lot of people that wanted to know how they could contribute to what we're doing. Uh, so there are, there are brochures out on the book table, but if they're out, uh, our website is very clear. It's uh, www.icrd.org. And if you know people who are looking to make that transition from success to significance, we'll be glad to help. <laughs> As to the question, uh, this is a very important question, and one of the things that's disturbed me is I've never felt that anybody in our administration, you know, is a it has really stepped back and looked at the big picture and say, hey, uh, what can we do by way of uh, uh, repositioning, redirecting existing assets that could be brought to bear in a helpful way? And more importantly, or equally important, is what new initiatives could we undertake to get at some of these causal factors? In fact, uh, we've just received a grant to work on a third book, uh, which the working title of which will be Religion, Terror, and Error, uh, colon, the urgent need for cultural engagement, but it's going to point out how in the wake of 9-11, we've been largely fixated on symptoms, spending billions on baggage inspectors and the like, and to then suggest what we might be able to do to position ourselves more effectively, to, to more effectively deal with the causal factors underlying this uh, global contest. And among them, uh, gets right to the question that we've, that's just been posed. And I think that if you were to look at the Foreign uh, Service Institute today, which trains all foreign service officers, it's a hodgepodge. There is no concerted effort to systematically incorporate uh, religious sensitivity and awareness in, in the, the students, you know, the foreign service officers' curriculums, if you will. Um, and I think, so the training, is one piece, one part of it, and, and we want to go after that. Uh, but even more to the point, I think that uh, uh, people should consider the possibility of establishing a new post in the Foreign Service uh, called Religion Attaché. Not religious attaché, but religion attaché. And uh, this, this would enable us to, I think, uh, uh, inform our foreign policy choices more effectively than we've had. Uh, in many uh, uh, places where we've stumbled, whether it's been Iran or Lebanon or even Vietnam, we had no clue <coughs> as to the religious dynamics that were taking place. And what all too often happens now, that religious questions are either handled by the cultural affairs officer, the political officer, or the ambassador, uh, and often get pushed aside for, because of more pressing business. And a lot of times these questions are pretty complex. So I think you need a stable of folks who are specially trained to be able to understand these things, to be able to understand the kind of language local religious leaders use, that can be in a position to actually, you know, uh, uh, establish those local relationships of trust and thereby better position us to understand the cultural implications of actions we're taking or should be taken or have already taken. And in looking hard at this, a stable of 30 of these attaches could cover our global interests 
at an annual cost of $10 million a year, which sounds like a lot of money, but when you compare it to the billions we're spending on the symptoms, uh, it's, uh, it pales in significance. So this is you know, either religion or something comparable, and whether it's a career a foreign service position or contracted, but people who've been specially trained to <coughs> enable us to deal with these things. You know, there is a, uh, a bureau within the State Department for democracy, human rights, and labor. Well, I think if labor can command special attention, certainly religion should as well. Thank you. Phil, is, uh, I invite you. Yeah. The, the question goes to a larger issue of how do we use our resources to protect our national security and our definition of <coughs> national security. Uh, over the years, I think uh, we, the public, and uh, governments, Republican and Democrat, have progressively exaggerated uh, the efficacy of military force as the primary source of our national security. And we have done that by creating, uh, diverting uh, massive resources uh, to uh, superb uh, training and uh, weaponry for our military forces but at the expense of adequate investment in diplomacy and economic development, which in the end uh, are uh, ultimately more effective in preventing a conflict before it bursts out and requires the intervention of military forces. We are in danger indeed, I fear, of becoming a kind of warrior state. Uh, and that's a, gr that's a grave danger, and we need seriously to think about it. I hope the next administration does. We are way behind among uh, the privileged uh, modern nations of the world in the proportion of our, uh, of our per capita income that we uh, devote to diplomacy, the soft side of our national security uh, enterprise, and that needs to be redressed uh, by the next administration. Thank you. The, the, question, uh, the question was also about um, how can uh, our diplomatic corps and development folks be trained uh, in, in religious ideas and become more literate. And I have to say that there's a limit to this. Um, there are efforts. Rabbi Arthur Schneier has been involved. A ver variety of um, experts in religion have gone to state and elsewhere and, and given lectures and so forth. But, <clears throat> and and that's, these are important efforts. But um, uh, let, me, let me put it this way. I, I lectured at the National War College in the 90s and into this decade. And I would begin my lecture to the Army, Navy, Air Force, and intelligence community that was gathered there, <clears throat> and the State Department experts on Islam among them, in the Arab world in particular. And I began by saying, how many of you have prayed today or fasted? Show of hands. And then I would get whatever I would get, and then I'd say, how many of you resent the question, think it's none of my business? There was one time when the only person who said he prayed today was the chaplain. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your job, it doesn't count. But most, most of the time, <laughs> Most of the time, uh, most of the, time the, the number of hands that went up about it's not an appropriate question was at least as large as the hands that went up who said they prayed because, as we've noted throughout this conference, we have this public-private distinction where those of us who are westernized and are not experts in religion, we have our own faith or we don't, but it's a private matter largely. And so it, it's, it's a little bit quixotic to think we're going to take a lot of those folks who are already in power and will be or in an important and make them experts in religion. So the, the point is this. <clears throat> One of the things I would say that always upset the State Department folks there, they'd very, get very upset because they thought it was threatening them, is there was no Muslim in the inner circles of our advising, advisory council for the president or at the higher levels for many years, and I don't know that there is now. I don't mean people who would be brought in for the kind of dog and pony show we all do and, and give our, our uh, little presentations, but I mean when the first George Bush said, let's, let's call it a new world order, there was no one around the table, and I don't mean the white Protestant Arabists who work in the State Department who know Arabic and think that's enough. It's not enough. I mean, and I, I don't, it's not to, to in any way um, undermine their credentials, but you need someone who has the cultural sense of what a phrase like the New World Order would, will mean on the street, or what a crusade would mean. You know, if, if some, to, to call it that. You, you need to have people, and there are American Muslims and other people of various religious traditions 
who, if they were in integrated a little bit more thoroughly into our inner circles of advisors, some of the mistakes we've made may have been overcome. So yes, train people. Yes, there's a lot that needs to be done on making folks more sophisticated about religion. But there are a lot of people out there already, not just in the academic world, but in think tanks and NGOs and so forth, who do have a sense, uh, a dimension, a cultural contribution to make, and they're loyal patriotic <coughs> Americans. We don't draw on those enough. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, just very quickly, um, a couple of points that have been raised. Um, just on that last point about the first George Bush and the New World Order, uh, Scott's right, there is a limit to how much uh, people can truly um, absorb this and use it in foreign policy because uh, Bush relied a lot on uh, the religious right and of course the phrase New World Order sent a lot of fundamentalists and, uh, and, and people, uh, members of the religious right, um, into, into a fit of, uh, of rage and Pat Robertson wrote a book called The New World Order um, very shortly after the Gulf War that said that the Bush administration was, I think I referred to it in my talk, that the Bush administration was um, being controlled by the Council on Foreign Relations in order to put the United States under the subservience um, of the United Nations. So, and those are people whom the Bush administration was trying to work really closely with, and Bush had evangelical advisors, and still he had a tin ear for this, um, for this sort of thing. Scott also mentioned the public-private divide, and something that Ellen and uh, Doug mentioned in their talks is the church-state divide that nobody's mentioned so far, and this is um, very powerful uh, in the American mindset. I don't know how you can um, get over the, the, the questions of how to blend church and state, sacred and secular, without violating um, Article 6 of the Constitution or the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Um, FDR, in, uh, just as America was about to enter the war, FDR decided that it would be wise, given everything that was happening, um, to have a representative to the Vatican. And America had never had one before. Um, and he didn't name uh, an official ambassador because he was worried about the Protestant community um, protesting it. And so he named an unofficial envoy, a guy called Myron Taylor, who wasn't a Catholic, he was an Episcopalian. And sure enough, as soon as he um, announced the appointment, there was an explosion of anger from not just uh, people on the right, fundamentalists or evangelicals, but mostly from uh, people on the left, mainline ecumenical uh, Presbyterians and Methodists and especially Baptists. Um, and FDR was, was taken aback and himself was really angry. And one of the most extraordinary letters I've ever seen from a president that I found in the archives, um, which wasn't couched in diplomatic language or polite phrasing, he used words to the head of the FCC, not the Federal uh, Communications Commission, but the Federal <laughs> Council of Churches. Um, he used words like absurd and um, I can't understand your reasoning and unhelpful, you, be, you know, we're at a time of war, and how many Catholics are there in the world? The Vatican is in the middle of Europe, of war-torn Europe. Surely we should have somebody talking to the people who are, you know, who, who oversee this large body of people. Harry Truman tried to appoint an official ambassador in 1951, and he couldn't because of the protest uh, from the Protestant community. It wasn't until the 1980s when Ronald Reagan um, could appoint an, uh, an ambassador, the point being, notions of, of the church-state separation are so sensitive, I don't know how you can make it a part of, a part of the regular program, but uh, the other speakers would have a better answer for that than I do. Our next question is going to come from the uh, balcony, but I'd invite Ellen and Rend. Is there anything you want to comment here? No. Nope. Okay, uh, just one comment I'd make. We've got so many questions, and this is not a criticism of our panelists, but if we could keep to shorter answers, then I think we'll get more questions coming in from the floor. <coughs> So, and I didn't want to say that before I'd invited Rand and Ellen to speak. <laughs> Up to the gallery. Okay. My name is Derek Dobacheski. I'm a student at the University of Maine. And I recently attended a lecture on campus by Charles H. Fairbanks. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute. He, um, he's worked, f he's been a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. And in his lecture, he spoke about Iraq and Muslim extremism in the country. And he didn't appear to draw much, if any, distinction between the so-called extremist ideologies, things like Wahhabism, things like that, and terrorism or militantism. And my question was mostly directed towards um, Mr. Johnson. I was wondering what you saw as the relationship between different sects of Islam ideologies and terrorism, because you said you spoke with Wahhabi madrasas, the leaders there, and worked with them, and 
seemed like it wasn't a direct link, but there was a, some sort of relationship. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Douglas? Well, uh, one thing I would just uh, announce at the outset is that uh, one of the fundamental assumptions underlying our work is that uh, everyone on any given side in a conflict is not bad, and uh, those who are bad aren't bad all the time. So we do try to play to the angels of their higher nature by bringing those transcendent aspects of religious faith to bear. Uh, what you're pointing out is a very important question, though, because it's, uh, it's really critical to get the term terminology right. There's a lot of things that we are saying in the West that are offensive to Muslims. I mean, just average uh, uh, non-terrorist-leaning Muslims who uh, uh, don't, don't like the uh, term Islamic terrorism, uh, who turn it right around and say, you know, when... Uh, someone blows up the uh, building in America who's a Christian, it's not called Christian terrorism. So, uh, and you get these, uh, these cautions that I think make a lot of sense, like uh, we should be very careful how we do use the word crusade, and as they should be very careful of how they use the word jihad because of the impressions that one another's communities have of what these words mean, which are not necessarily accurate at all times. Uh, but uh, there are, it, it, particularly in the Wahhabi, o overseas, by the way, it's called Ali Hadith. Uh, the term Wahhabi is, is uh, seen to be pejorative. Uh, but uh, uh, there's a certain sect within uh, the Ali Hadith uh, school of thought that uh, it really is sort of at uh, the cutting edge of this, uh, the terrorism that we're, we're worried about. So. Uh, there's no, not enough time here to <clears throat> try to give a lesson in right terminology, but one of the things, too, <clears throat> in addition to all that, is that we should not buy in on the kind of language, uh, self-style language that people like bin Laden use, you know, describing themselves as holy warriors and the like. When we use the same terms that mean that, then we are just reinforcing the image they're trying to create. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's, it's very interesting to look at how bin Laden justified 9-11 when the Quran specifically prohibits suicide and a, attacks against innocents. And, you know, he goes through the same kind of logic flow that led us to be bombing civilian populations in World War II. Uh, it's understandable, but whether it's acceptable or not is a whole different question. It's a very long-winded non-answer to your question, but, <clears throat> but it is important. Okay, thank you. Rend? I, I, first of all, there's a great deal of obscurity about terminology, and uh, the confusion is not just here in, in the United States. Uh, it's even within the Muslim world, because people identify themselves differently, they have different labels for different things, and so the uh, whole vocabulary and nomenclature is in flux and uh, is uh, very ill-defined. But I, for example, we talk about Muslim. Um, well, I'm a Muslim. I may be a practicing Muslim, a semi-practicing Muslim, a not practicing Muslim, but the fact is I am a Muslim. I was born so and, and so on. Um, I'm not an Islamist because that has political connotations. It implies that uh, Islamists tend to think that Islam is not only a religion uh, and a faith between a, an individual and, and the deity uh, and a set of beliefs and, and prayers and so on, but also uh, a way of governance that Islam also can serve as uh, tools and precepts for governance and so on. You move along that spectrum. So it's very difficult. And then what is a fundamentalist? It's very difficult to identify. Um, we don't have sort of neat little boxes in which to put these names. But going back to Wahhabism and terrorism and militarism, which are the three uh, words that the que uh, 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 questioner mentioned, Wahhabism is the, the name of a subset uh, of one of the Sunni sects. It is not recognized as one of the f five major sects, but it is, in fact, a Sunni sect. It's a subset of Hanbali. And it was developed in Saudi Arabia by somebody called Abdul Wahhab, uh, who tended to think much more uh, strictly in a more puritanical ways about uh, Islam and wanted to go back a little bit like the Protestants did to 
the major texts, which are the, the Quran and the Sunnah, that is to say, the way of the Prophet Muhammad. And so it was Islam stripped down of a lot of the baggage that had a, a, a been attached to it over the centuries. Wahhabism does not mean terrorism. It doesn't mean militarism. It is a system of belief. It is a sect of Islam. Now, it does happen that, that the Wahhabis have tended to produce a much more uh, violent interpretation or radical interpretation of some verses and chapters and instructions that are in the Quran and those interpretations particularly attached to the relationship of Muslims to non-Muslims. Uh, interpretations of what jihad is, interpretations of what the rules of war, what is the protection of a Muslim community, what is an attack on the Muslim community. Their interpretations tend to be a little more radical. And so if we see uh, that some Wahhabis use violent tools, then we can't say all Wahhabis are terrorists or all Wahhabis are violent. We need to be very careful about the distinctions. And I'm disappointed that whoever was speaking um, to college students wasn't careful to make those distinctions clear. Thank you. We're going to move to Rockland for our next question. And it'll come up in our screen in just a moment from Helen Hughes. Population growth threatens to exceed the planet's carrying capacity. How can religion offer solutions? Malthusian mm -hmm. solutions are the only alternative. Well, we're getting a question there and a, a bit of an answer. So from <laughs> Helen, can we leave that up on the screen just for a moment so that the, the uh, speakers can get a chance to absorb the question? And um, have to get rid of all the Catholics. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew and you Nostatio. call yourself a religious diplomat? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Netius. Um, the the, wor the uh, most of the estimates of, of population growth are from the UN, um, and they recently issued a report. I think it's within the last three years, in which they have dramatically dropped the estimates as to the population growth rates of the world. Um, and so these are official UN statistics, not from the US government or from uh, any particular. And they didn't do it under duress. They did it because the demographic data is now showing dramatically lower rates of growth. And the reason for that is very interesting. Uh, there are three factors that the empirical evidence, development uh, evidence shows affects gr population growth rates. The first and most important is economic growth. The, the wealthier people are, the smaller their family size, including, I might add, in Catholic countries, including in Catholic and Muslim countries. Okay, so, it, it, and, and the second factor is the education level of women. Women who have graduated from high school have smaller families than women who are illiterate. And in both cases, there have been dramatic improvements, as I mentioned yesterday, between the end of the Second World War. If you look at 1950 till now, there's been dramatic improvements in all the indicators. We always focus, which is, uh, which is becoming, coming back to haunt us now, on how bad things are. Well, things aren't bad compared to where they were 50 years ago. They're excellent, actually. There's more progress that's been made in human history. And by constantly, and I know why people do it, to get more money. The problem is, <laughs> do you know what the opponents of foreign aid are saying? Well, if things are so bad and we gave you all this money the 50 years, what did you do with it? You know, it's a failure and so we're not going to give you any more money. Mm -hmm. It's self-defeating to keep saying these things. And it's empirically wrong. It's empirically wrong. So, so there has been an improvement and that's why the rates are dropping. The third thing is family planning is more available in, 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 in more countries. But the two most important factors are the education of women and economic growth. And because of what's happened in Asia, the growth rates are dropping. So the estimates instead of 40 or 50 billion are, I don't know, it, it caps out. It, I, I don't remember the data. I don't want to say it on the, uh, uh, here. But you can go on the internet and get, go to the UN, and you can see what the estimates are. But there's a huge drop from what they were estimating before. And if we keep the growth rates up, and, we, and there's a, continues to be a focus on girls' education, you will see them continue to drop even more. Ellen, is there something you want to pitch in with here? 
Well, I think what we heard from Catherine Marshall this morning would suggest that this could be a very promising area for uh, dialogue between leaders of faith communities and the developing world. Um, I appreciate what Andrew said. I do believe that for India, China, and many other countries, um, you know, demographics are still determining how well they can prosper, and there are still problems of uh, with you know the demographic shape. There's a there's a wonderful study out by the Population um, Population Action International called "The Shape of Things to Come," and it looks at the shape of countries. You know, how wide is the the youth <coughs> pyramid at the bottom, and and how do countries get into this more sort of upright uh, demographic shape. And um, so there are still countries that are going to face future public policy challenges to build enough schools, to be either, to either produce or import enough food, et cetera. So I, don't, we should, I appreciate what Andrew said, but I think this is still, for a significant number of countries, uh, a major challenge. Um, I've also heard that there's some new research being done about climate change that tries to game out what will climate change look like if the world population stabilizes at 8 billion or 10 billion or 12 billion and if you you know over a century or whatever and it hugely matters whether the total population of the earth stabilizes um, and that the 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 rate at which global climate change will happen is profoundly affected by demography. Right. So we should care that this is still an absolutely essential public policy issue and that culture and communities of faith um, need to think about this as they think about global climate change and maybe can be positive influences on it. Thank you. Microphone number two. <coughs> Bob Tierney again, formally from uh, Camden. <laughs> uh, I, I hope this passed the uh, crisp test. Uh, oh, I'm sure it will, Bob. Quickly go to this. Uh, people have asked, uh, come up to me so nicely and said, gee, uh, how does this compare this weekend with what it was like 21 years ago? And uh, so I have maybe 50 images that were racing through my head during this weekend, but I'm gonna share two with you because I think they're important. Then I have a question. Oh, good. So there's a little deception, but not <laughs> so much. <laughs> when I was here, uh, what, there was a guy uh, who closed us out, a closer. And it was, uh, the auditorium was much darker, but anyway, he claimed to look back there by those exit signs and so forth, and he said, you know, there's Margaret Chase Smith over there, is Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain between the right and the left exit, Ed Muskie over there, and I'll say Bill Braun because he's an old buddy of mine. But they look back and they and they're sitting back there, they're nodding at what you're doing here. And they're saying they're well pleased and they're clapping their hands. Hmm. Hmm. So I think they're still there. I don't know whether you see them, but I think they're clapping their hands. Um, <laughs> The next image, uh, the first year we had uh, uh, Brent Scowcroft. Brent Scowcroft taught me the only elective I had in my college was Russian history. He was a captain then. But he came. And uh, in those days, we used to send people around. Uh, we had different venues. And we sent them around in the school buses. And there was a little girl in the school bus, the back of the bus. And she was, we tried to get people from the islands and uh, she was from uh, Ilaho, sitting there by herself. Brent Scowcroft, in his non-assuming, congenial way, went down and sat next to her. She said, OK, if I sit here? And she said, that would be great. And so I went back there, and I sort of tried to listen in. It was terrific. Uh, when I was, there was a gentleman up here from Somalia. I don't see him up there, but he was sitting there yesterday. He's over here now. <laughs> Tripped me up. <laughs> oh, down. He's been promoted. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's where the rubber meets the road. I'm so glad to see that the university students are here and they're participating. And so I think that's terrific. And uh, so that's yet another image I have. Question. <laughs> 
Uh, this question would really be for the keynoter, but since he's not here, however, he did a get, got a big hand when he asked this, or when he commented on this yesterday. It was not part of a question. Uh, but he took torture off the list for U.S. responses uh, to terrorism. And so my question goes something like this. I am the uh, director of national intelligence, and you are the president's. And uh, I have good information that says, and I'm bringing it to you, that says that uh, by the end of next week, uh, it's very, very likely we're going to have a strike, uh, a, uh, a nuclear strike uh, in uh, San Francisco, San Francisco. Now, I watched the front line, which you may have seen a couple of years ago, and it talked that London was the model here. And uh, they had that, a little suitcase full of strontium-90, which is easy to get. <laughs> and they dumped it out in the airstream. And uh, London was taken out. Something like three million people died in the first couple hours. 300 or three uh, other million uh, died later and so forth. And, but London was taken out for three generations. Basically, couldn't go back in. Oh, could we get to our question? Yeah. So the question is, <laughs> Uh, what are you going to, if you're the president and you take this on and you take, uh, you take torture off the table, uh, you, Mr. President, can authorize me to do this because I think in the law it still says you can do a finding and you can, it's your judgment. But are you going to let me do that or not? Okay. And Thank if you don't let me do it, what are you going to tell the people the next day when uh, San Francisco's off the uh, air? Phil, thank you for your courage to uh, take on the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I learned uh, something about torture uh, when I served as the ambassador at large for counterterrorism. There's been a debate in the government for years uh, until recently uh, those who advocated torture uh, on the basis of what you've described as the ticking bomb theory uh, have been outnumbered. The ticking bomb scenario uh, is, is very, very rare in my uh, limited experience uh, working in intelligence and counterterrorism. Uh, I never experienced such a scenario. Uh, even if these scenarios were more common, I don't think they will be because uh, we often exaggerate the precision and quality of our intelligence and our ability to uh, uh, listen to bo these bombs start ticking. And more often than not, uh, the human intelligence that we gather that predicts such uh, ticking bombs are, turn out to be unreliable. The cost of, of torture uh, to uh, our notions of a civilization and the dignity of uh, human beings is huge. Uh, I remember vividly when a college professor once said to me, if anything goes, everything is soon gone. And I think it's true. Uh, the nuclear biological chemical specter that has given us such concern uh, is not one to be ignored nor should we exaggerate it and bend all of our rules uh, and uh, change our institutions in anticipation of such an act of mass terrorism. It is very difficult to kill a lot of people with chemical weapons or biological weapons. It's never been done. And were the technology available to do this, I reckon someone would have tried it. Uh, nuclear bombs are extraordinarily difficult to steal and trans transport by terrorists. Uh, that too has never happened, and there are major safeguards uh, to prevent that. Um, nevertheless, we have to we have to think about and plan against such scenarios. But to authorize torture uh, to a aid in this process of prevention, I think, is wrong. The law enforcement people. Uh, the FBI will be the first to tell you that torture doesn't work, that usually what you get by physical pressure uh, creating pain uh, is false information. Uh, and when the FBI was asked to participate in torture by our armed forces in Iraq, they said, wait a minute, we're going we're gonna to steer clear of this because we know better, and we've had lots of experience. Thank you.
friend. Yeah, I, I'm not a security expert and I really shouldn't be saying very much on this, but I do want to talk about uh, what happened in 2004 in Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Um, now, um, as far as we know, this was not uh, officially sanctioned uh, behavior, it wasn't officially sanctioned torture. But what it did to US prestige and moral authority and moral standing in Iraq and around the Arab world was absolutely incalculable in its damage. And I think the most important thing that the United States has to offer the world is not uh, its armed forces, as Phil said, but really its system of values. And uh, when Abu Ghraib happened, for a lot of people in the region, that image of the United States as a country of values collapsed. Uh, and the reaction that I heard, not only in Iraq, but, but in other parts of the Middle East, is how can they do this? Uh, maybe it wasn't sanctioned, but how can they not, how can they fail to train their armed forces to respect people's dignity, even when those people are detainees. So it's a question truly of, of the image that, the self-image of the United States. Who are we? What are we about? What do we stand for? And I can tell you, the world is watching. Mm -hmm. Things like that don't go unnoticed. Mm -hmm. so. Our next question is... Our question is actually from Portland, but I will come to microphone one after we've been to Portland. So from Brian Cushing, where do the belief systems, where do the belief systems of one third of the world's population, East Asia, fit into the theme of this conference? Very interesting question. Mm -hmm. Ellen? Douglas? Well, Confucianism, Buddhism? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, uh, for example, in our work in Kashmir, we've uh, been dealing with Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims. And uh, the same principles apply. And we're largely fixated on Islam now because of the, for obvious reasons, but, but the same principles apply. And we have been able to make them work in just the same way that we have uh, with, uh, with the Muslim community. I think Andrew Preston would also like to pick up the question. Uh, people forget that that's, uh, ignorance of Asian religion was one of the things that undermined uh, US policy in Vietnam. Even before, or just as the war itself was, was getting going, there were two major Buddhist revolts in 1963 and 1966 that totally caught um, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations by surprise. And uh, you know, forget about the communists, those two revolts um, pretty much washed away uh, the even limited progress that uh, America was making and made it almost impossible uh, to, um, uh, to win that war. I don't think it was a winnable war anyway, but if it could have been won, um, you had to do it with the Buddhists and there was total ignorance of, of, uh, of, of even who the Buddhists were in, in South Vietnam, 90% of the population. Thank you. Ellen? Well, I think we should remind ourselves that the 21st century is likely to be the Asian century, so we should all, in our religious literacy courses, uh, let's make sure that we're uh, including Asian languages. And I think the pendulum has swung so much to thinking that the deficit of knowledge is about Islam. Let's not make the mistake and have a knowledge deficit about um, religions that, uh, for which there are hundreds of millions of adherents in East Asia. Um, but I do think that some of the issues are roughly, you know, some of the public policy issues are really quite similar. I was in Vietnam recently, and there is the issue of the property of the Catholic Church, the treatment of Christians. Um, in uh, Indonesia, the issue is, you know, Sharia law and how it applies to non-Muslim residents of places in Indonesia where Sharia law may be voted in by provincial councils. So I think some of the issues resonate. I think a lot of Asian countries are diverse in their religion, even if Buddhism or Confucianism is the, is the dominant cultural uh, manifestation. They also have to deal with religious minorities and tolerance of religion. So um, I think it's a good question, and I think it's something we should just make sure to 
put, put on, on your list for a future Camden conference. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew, anything else? Uh, I sit on another board in addition to the one <laughs> Doug Johnson's of a guy, very controversial, but I, I think it's growing, there's growing acceptance for his, his work, Larry Harrison, who's a former aid officer, actually, who's at Tufts, and it's on uh, the issue of the relationship between values and culture and development. And he's done a lot. When he first came out with this, people were outraged with it. In fact, the AID was split in half. Half the agency is absolutely right. The other half said he's, he's a racist and he's wrong and all this stuff. Um, but his research over many years now, 18 years on this, shows very interesting that three uh, traditions uh, appear to be related to high rates of growth. Economic growth, but also social and political growth, and uh, not political growth, social uh, improvement, social progress, and um, uh, economic progress. And they are Protestant Christianity, Judaism, and particularly Conf Confucianism, interestingly enough. And he, he goes through why there appears to be these relationships. Now, it doesn't mean other religions are, are, you know, are the opposite, but it does appear that values affect development in a profound way. And, and, and that question is not, and it's, been, it's a very disputed issue, a very sensitive issue. Um, the Chinese, even pre-Confucian, but it's not part of Confucianism, look at, they worship their ancestors seven generations before and they plan for seven generations to the future. That is a frightening idea because we look right now. The old Brahmin Yankees, who I used to come from Massachusetts, look, used to look at their great-great-grandchildren. I mean, I wish we had some of these old Puritan uh, values still around. We don't have them anymore. People say we have them. We don't have them. People don't look at generations ahead in the United States. And that's one of our biggest domestic problems, which is we're not doing. The Chinese are doing that, because it's part of Confucian culture and Chinese culture. And their culture has affected Taiwan and Korea and uh, Southeast Asia, and there's a, a large Chinese community that's had dominant Chinese community in, uh, even though it's small, in uh, Indonesia, and of course Singapore is Confucian Chinese. So there's a large argument that there's a relationship between the East Asian giants and growth mm -hmm. and uh, what's happening in the Confucian tradition. And, and Confucian is, is a philosophic system, not a religion, but it, it is such a strong philosophic concession, it has the effect <laughs> from a purely developmental standpoint of religious <clears throat> values. And so it is something we need to look at and yeah. be respectful of and understand the dynamics of because I frankly think there's something we can learn in this country from them. That ties into many of the themes that we raised in the 2006 conference on China uh, at the Camden Conference. Thank you very much indeed for your patience. Microphone number one in the auditorium here. Um, William Baker, retired professor of history, University of Maine, and now living in Bass Harbor. Um, this question is primarily for Scott Appleby and Andrew Preston because they especially yesterday morning uh, made much of 20th century America and especially in the evolution of fundamentalism, evangelicalism around the issues of post-millennial and premillennial theologies and how it pertains to our social structure and particularly to foreign policy issues. I would like them to plug in the person I consider the most important, uh, sorry, the most prominent religious figure of the 20th century in America. I think the most important is probably Martin Luther King. But I think the most prominent is Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. Prominent, well-known, popular. Would you plug Billy Graham into what's happening, what has happened, and what is happening in the evangelical movement, which is so important Thank in you. our thinking. Thank you. Thanks. That, um, that gives me a chance to take a nudge at Andrew over here. Which I, because he, um, when he started his very riveting presentation, I think if I heard him right, he said, this premillennial, postmillennial, it's abstract, and these academics are coming up with these theories. It's no theory. <clears throat> There's nothing theoretical about it. No, 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 I, w I wasn't saying, don't misquote me now. So. No, that's what I understood. So. No, 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 I wasn't criticized. I was just saying I don't understand all that my, myself. And on a practical level, at the ground level, in the third world, it's not. Okay, not, right. Well, I'm in this world, no, no, that's fine. In this world, it is, it is very practical. That is, in your question, that is, so I misheard you. 
but it's not a theory. It, it, it really does, this premillennial, postmillennial um, worldview really does have real world applications. Billy Graham, I'd call him a soft premillennialist. And, and I'll tell you what this means. And it, it, it's actually very important for, um, for mainstream evangelicalism and its political outlooks. In 1960, Jerry Falwell said, you know who the most dangerous man in America is? People say Elvis, John Kennedy, Catholic president. No, it was Billy Graham. Why Billy Graham? <clears throat> because Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham share 99.9% .9 of the world view. They, they agree on the five fundamentals, which I won't list for you, but they, they have the supernatural worldview. They agree in the premillennial scheme that I talked about. But the thing Falwell didn't like about, <clears throat> about Billy Graham is that he was soft in this sense. This whole thing about premillennialism was for Billy Graham important, <clears throat> and, he, and he talks about it, but he would interact with rabbis and priests and, and Lutheran ministers on a variety of social issues, and he was mainstream. And so that doctrine was not a barrier to others. It was a way he invited it, soft in the sense that it wasn't a weapon. He would call people to renew their faith within his community, but it didn't in any way build a wall uh, between him and others in the religious community or in the secular community, and Falwell didn't like it. Of course, when Falwell formed the moral majority, 20 years later, he made alliances with Catholic priests on abortion and feminists on pornography and so forth. So what goes around comes around. Now, th this is important, though, because the, con uh, the question earlier about environmental eschatology that someone asked. You yes, there's, you can talk about James Watt and the fundamentalist evangelical. The environment isn't important because we're not going to be around any longer because Christ is going to return. And, and, and yet this soft version of environmental eschatology or premillennialism, these doctrines, when I say soft, I mean they can be internalized. They don't have to be projected out into the public arena. So to say Jesus Christ is going to return and, and be in judgment, that can be a personal statement as I think Billy Graham makes it. This is something, this judgment comes with you yourself, it, on yourself. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to go out and uh, be an opponent to people who don't believe this. In the same way, environmental stuff, uh, Rick Sizek was mentioned before, he's an evangelical. He is eschatological about the environment, but in a very different way. He takes that fervor about end times, eschatological, for those who aren't familiar with the term, means what, what is the time of fulfillment, how God is going to work out destiny. Well, what he says is, yeah, you know what's right? If we don't get this environment cleaned up and be stewards, which is a biblical term, mm -hmm. it's going to be the end. And so he turns that on its head. Mm -hmm. So like, the point I'm trying to make is these somewhat esoteric and, 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 and seemingly, if you're not in that culture, seeming a little odd, those are very powerful symbolic tokens, so to speak, that can play out in different ways politically and not always in a fundamentalist hard edge way. They can be, as in Billy Graham, an opening, an alliance building, an evangelical bridge, or in Sizek, to environmental uh, purposes and causes. Andrew Preston. Um, yeah, that's a great question, and I'll try and give some, um, just a brief historical background. Uh, Billy Graham and the Cold War was, of course, enormously influential as well as being prominent. And I mentioned that the, uh, in my talk yesterday that the 1950s, um, a lot of historians see that as another great awakening in American history of a revival of religious enthusiasm. And Billy Graham, of course, was central to that. He was also central to um, forming this ideological glue or cement of anti-communism and extreme patriotism uh, that really supported, uh, gave popular support to a lot of um, American foreign policy in the, in the 1950s and into the 1960s, um, in, including to the extent of promoting missionary activity and, and sort of putting a Christian face on American foreign policy. Um, to link it back to the previous question, um, you know, the, the, uh, the three most prominent um, Asian leaders of the Cold War, certainly in the, in the 50s and into the 60s, uh, who were, I don't want to say American clients, because they certainly had some autonomy, but um, for lack of a better word, were American clients. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek in Taiwan, Syngman Rhee in South Korea, and Noden Ziem in South Vietnam, all were Christian in non-Christian lands. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek was a Methodist. Syngman Rhee, I believe, was a Presbyterian converted by American missionaries, and Ziem was a Catholic. And this, um, especially in Vietnam, really came to backfire on U.S. foreign policy um, because these figures were seen to be authoritarian and representative, and they fed into a groundswell of, of anti-Americanism that really then emerged with real force 
um, later on in the 60s and 70s um, um, and early 80s. The interesting thing about Billy Graham was that he, uh, you know, he, he, he's definitely a softer sort of, uh, of premillennialist or evangelical. Um, he seemed to learn a lot from this and really pulled back in the last part of the Cold War and still was counselor to a lot of presidents and counselor is, you know, giving advice. Um, but for instance, when George H.W. Bush was considering what to do uh, with Iraq when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990, Billy Graham was, um, he wasn't telling him only to negotiate and not to use force, but he was very worried and advised caution and advised uh, Bush that force should be the last resort. And he said, I'll support you whatever your decision will be, but we really have to take this carefully. But finally, another way to link Billy Graham to what's happening today, and it's not something I know so much about, certainly not as much as Scott, but, but Franklin Graham and, and, and uh, sort of the, 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 the family dynamic and changes in uh, evangelicalism and, and, uh, and, and, and its relation to US foreign policy. We're going to move upstairs to the balcony, but I would say patience over here, microphone number two, we're coming to you next. Number three. Yeah, hi, Pete Kalajan from Camden. My question is, um, you'll see it in the, in the political debate uh, that American exceptionalism seems to be alive and well, especially in the campaign. How do we get beyond that? Because until we do, I don't think that we can um, engage as equals or in, in, any, in any meaningful way with the rest of the world, especially in a religious point of view. Beyond American exceptionalism, Douglas? Well, I can give you one example. Uh, we, um, in 2003, I had the privilege of being part of an Abrahamic delegation that went to Iran. Uh, it was headed by uh, Cardinal McCarrick, who was then Archbishop of Washington. Was, the delegation was Abrahamic in that it included Jewish, Muslim, and Christian participation. Uh, we went around for 10 days, met with uh, lots of grand ayatollahs and the top leaders of government and the like came back to this country and then uh, two years later, we raised the funds to sponsor a return visit, uh, which went also Abrahamic, also nine in number and also for 10 days. And <clears throat> that turned out well, but at the end of it, I got to thinking that, you know, uh, this business of building relationships and trust is all well and good, but in light of the looming nuclear question, I really didn't see how that was gonna get us where we needed to be as quickly as we need to be there. So it caused me to think about other things that we might be able to do. And a couple of years earlier, I had played in a war game, uh, and Iran was the target. And it caused me to wonder, what might a peace game look like? So <laughs> developed that, and rather than a scenario-driven exercise like a war game, came up with a sort of a facilitated brainstorming concept where we would bring uh, top people from both countries together for a week to try to wrestle with uh, how one can overcome the obstacles that stand in the way of a cooperative relationship because uh, there are so many areas of potential cooperation where we both have interests that could be complementary. Uh, and if we were able to get there, of course, our options for bringing peace to the region would just skyrocket. Um, I had talked with Roger Fisher, an old colleague from Harvard, uh, who was willing to facilitate this, and he's, you know, developed the win-win theory of negotiation. And when I tried this out on the Iranian ambassador to the UN, his name was Zarif, very sharp guy, uh, he got very enthused about it. He had read Fisher's book, Getting to Yes, and he was intellectually curious as to how that could play out in reality. And I told him, I said, look, I'd like to do this, ideally, in Iran not in a neutral location, because uh, for two reasons. One, it will, it will um, provide added incentive for the Americans to want to participate. And I said, but secondly, it would also convey a note of humility that is all too absent from US foreign policy these days by going to their turf to, to uh, engage in such an exercise. He says, well, this was just before their presidential elections and Rafsan Johnny was favored at the time. He said, well, if Rafsan Johnny wins, you can do this in Iran. He says, anyone else, it might have to be Europe. <coughs> well, when Ahmadinejad won, all bets were off because nobody knew where they stood. But this last fall, I had the opportunity to present uh, this idea to uh, uh, Ahmadinejad and he expressed his support for it. So now we're trying to uh, get a fix on what kinds of people they would make available, uh, what freedom of thought they would have, and then how we prevent the White House from torpedoing it. Uh, but these are the kinds of things. I think this is a very important question, and the fact is that we need to, we need to tone down the, the perceived arrogance uh, 
you know, we do need to sort of think uh, in more humble t terms about uh, taking into uh, account other people's views much more than we seem to at the moment. Okay, let's just jump right down into. Uh, I'm Bob Hirsch from uh, beautiful downtown Owl's Head, Maine. Uh, this actually builds on that last question. A number of you have alluded to the fact that religion is seldom the cause of a war, but once it's introduced, it greatly adds to the complexity and can prolong what is happening. If the war is over land, land can be divided. If the war is over power, power can be shared. But religion brings non-negotiable elements into a conflict. If you believe God granted you the West Bank, it's uh, very difficult to come up with a compromise to that. So it's a, a, a practical question. In situations when that line has been crossed and it becomes God has done this or that, how do you enter negotiations? What kind of a strategy can you have to break through that? Let's give them a moment to think about it. Uh, Phil. Well, religion is a, is a universe which spans uh, unyielding maximalist ext extremism uh, with uh, a religion that uh, also expresses humility, uh, respect for what is unknown, uh, tolerance, uh, and all of the great religions have, uh, have these two, have, have experienced these two themes, the, the extremist and the, uh, the more pragmatic, the more searching, the more humane, and the more tolerant. Uh, unfortunately, in many conflict situations, people who are claim to be religious and who claim to speak on behalf of God are not really religious people. They are people who are more interested in power. And they have discovered uh, the uh, extraordinary power of invoking religion uh, and disguising uh, political, uh, territorial, and other issues in, in religious terms. Uh, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the conflict I know most about, uh, religion has not been invoked uh, successfully on behalf of compromise. And one reason for that, as I said, is that the religious establishment in Israel uh, is a maximalist uh, uh, authoritarian establishment that rejects the more mainstream, uh, modern, humane, uh, tolerant uh, strain of Judaism, which I think is predominant in Judaism. Uh, and therefore, the Israeli public is very secular, militantly secular, and, and knows very little about Ju Judaism. So, uh, some way, in some way, the positive and powerful strands of Judaism, which are linked to the, the central powerful strands of Islam and Christianity need to be brought together. Uh, I despair, frankly, of doing that in, in, a, in, in the near future in Israel or, or in Palestine. I think that uh, there is a great potential for doing that in this country, uh, where American Jews, American Catholics and Protestants and Muslims, uh, for the most part, believe in, in this more humane, uh, progressive uh, brand of uh, religion. Uh, and I think uh, much more can be done in this country. One thing we need to do is to, to, to watch our language about how we describe other faiths and other religions, as Doug has said. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the activist peace groups in this country, Protestant, uh, Catholic, interfaith, and Jewish, uh, have not harnessed, I think, the powerful and positive uh, language of religion and religious values uh, on behalf of their cause. And I think that's, a, that's something they should explore more deeply. Thank you, Phil. Uh, Scott, just a brief comment, and then we're going to our next question from uh, Rockland. I'm going to tie together the American exceptionalism question with this one very quickly. Right. Okay by saying that, uh, and, and in do so and give a nod to Doug Johnson's work, 
at, uh, showing my spirit of forgiveness toward Doug. Um, the, the, uh, <laughs> uh, I was in uh, East, uh, Eastern Mennonite University right after the Israeli tanks surrounded Janine and held J this town of Janine and Palestine hostage. And there was a woman there from Janine, a uh, Muslim woman, and there was um, a woman from the Gushi Munim at this seminar. So polar opposites. And I was cast without much experience in doing this in a kind of uh, a mediation role that was structured to talk them through, and it was very difficult. They were both very angry at one another, and they had the religious absolutism you talk about on both sides, and particularly the woman from Janine. There was an Israeli man there, and she had said, when she first met him, this is supposed to be kind of a peace-building seminar, she said, um, she looked at him, she, he asked, can I come sit with you at lunch? And she looked at him in the eye and said, yes, I want to look at the face of a killer face to face, was, was her response. So this is a tough crowd. Um, <laughs> and and I, it, was, it was a 90 minute session, we're trying to bring them together and, and it, was, it was very difficult. There were two items though, two items where there was an opening. And this was when uh, I asked, do you, do you believe that um, the other person, the other group, uh, so the, the radical Jews or, or the Muslims, have the right to, play, to pray at their sacred spaces, their sacred places in the Holy Land. And they both kind of begrudgingly after a moment said yes. They have a right to pray at their sacred spaces. Now, that took a bit. The second one was, do you grieve when a child of the other side is killed in the conflict? And these were both women, both mothers, and they kind of almost begrudgingly said yes. Now, so two points about that. One is, with these, this, this profile you've described, not every religious person is, is of that deep, deep, embittered profile in a sense, an absolutist, et cetera. <clears throat> but with this deep profile, there is an abiding respect, if you dig down deep enough, for the other who is a person of faith and commitment, even though there's differences about belief and so forth, and that's part of what Doug is doing, I think, and others. So religion, sometimes we want to stay away from this absolutist religion because we're afraid of it and it seems to be irrational and so forth, and there are elements of it. On the other hand, sometimes uh, re respect is built upon that foundation. The other thing is the American exceptionalism thing. My, my little two cents on American exceptionalism is, and this is the answer about the children, you know, well, yes, I would grieve if the child was killed on the other side. American exceptionalism, the negative effects of it will be eliminated if we can get Americans to value a Palestinian or a, or a Pakistani life or an Iraqi life as much as an American life. Mm -hmm. and, and that's Stop. A, you know, that's kind of a facile applause line in a way, but it's, it's, a, it's an educational task in a way. It, and it, it, someone said very eloquently, may have been Catherine, it's all about human dignity. Someone saying it's about human dignity. That's really the key, mm -hmm. I think, to so much of this the discourse of human dignity and indicating we're on that side without, without making the kind of differentiations that sometimes come with American exceptionalism. Rand, a fine, uh, comment very, from you? I, I, very quickly, first of all, some, um, some violence and some wars are about religion. Uh, and I'll tell you what I mean by that. For example, if you look at Al-Qaeda, they are not trying to get territory. Uh, they're not trying to get greater economic uh, uh, power. They truly believe that Islam is under assault and that they are the soldiers of Islam who are going to repel uh, the Christian hosts that are trying to wipe out the Muslim nation and the Muslim ummah. Um, and so this is, that is a situation mm -hmm. where you have, uh, God is totally on your side, you're totally right because you are fulfilling God's work, will. But I, I think in all those cases, even in that case, what we have, and if you look at the Qaeda rhetoric, Osama bin Laden, Zawahiri, and so on, you have a narrative of history that is so radically different from our narrative of history. Uh, you know, what is the Middle East about? What is Islam about? What is the relationship between Christianity and Islam over historical perspective? What is that about? The way they narrate it and they see it is so very different from the way we narrate it and see it. And I think this is really what we need to work on while recognizing that Al-Qaeda is not uh, a, a very reasonable uh, um, adversary that if we could just 
talk about power and territory, we could get somewhere. No, we're not going to get anywhere. They have core beliefs that are religiously based according to their interpretation of religion. The best thing that we can do is work on this narrative of history that, that, and, and close the gaps if, and also understand what is driving those people there. And, and addressing that, but I think in terms of saying, well, they're reasonable and we can bring them down, I don't think that's very realistic. We have to, Thank you. We have to understand that there are people who are, you know, Great. just hardline. And yes. Uh, we're going to take one final question. It's going to come from a remote site. So uh, we're going over to Rockland now, to the Strand Theatre, and uh, from Thomas Steele Mallet. Uh, the post-colonial worlds of indigenous peoples one in which local religion has been devastated, can faith-based aid agencies create an atmosphere of mutual respect in their work so as not to further erode indigenous lifeways? And I was hoping for a simple question at the end of the conference. <laughs> so let's leave that up on the screen for a moment and uh, invite brief. The dinner gong's about to, the lunch gong's about to ring, I think. So. Uh, Anyone want to field an answer to that question? <laughs> Andrew Natsios. I'll, I'll make a comment coming out of a faith-based NGO because I was sort of confronted with this. Um, I had a call once from, uh, I was with World Vision, even though I come out of the contemplative tradition, uh, they, it's, very even, it's evangelical, but it's very ecumenical in World Vision. And so, I wasn't familiar with all of the evangelical language and the structures. I learned a lot about it when I was there. But we had a call from the, the, um, the um, <clears throat> country director in Ghana. And the country director in Ghana was an African, entire staff was African, and he was an evangelical. He was a medical doctor. And Joe Riverson was his name. And he said, Andrew, the uh, Saudis have funded a Koran to be distributed to every school child in Ghana through the Ministry of Education. And there's a, there's a, you know, I don't know, I don't remember what the percentage is, but there's a small population of Muslims. This is not for all the Muslims, it's for the entire country. And he said, you know, it's very bad. He said, can you get me money? I said, well, I can, certainly can't get it from the US government. I will go to the missions part of World Vision and see, we, we want a Bible for every child as well. And the ministry said, we'll give both. Well, the problem with indigenous religion is, for the most part, it's not written down. I mean, just let's be completely detached from our own tradition here. It's not written down. There's no scripture. I mean, there may be stories, but frequently they're not even written down. So if you talk to Africans who are worried about the... the um, they, they see a conflict between uh, Salafid, Salafidist Islam funded by Saudi Arabia Many people, even from, the, from traditional religious traditions do. And they see the only way of engaging is through another great religious tradition, Christianity. They don't go back, none of them go back and say, we can use the, the indigenous religion to defend ourselves against this aggressive. They see it. And I'm just, I'm not making a comment. I'm just telling what you, they said to me because uh, I, I didn't understand all of it and I listened to them. And that's how they saw it. Um, and, 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 um, and so I think, frankly, the, the, the indigenous religious traditions in many developing countries, uh, people will keep them, and some of them, syncretic traditions, particularly in Catholicism and even Protestantism, pull in some of those traditions. If you listen to the hymns uh, in the Protestants, I, I went to an Orthodox church and I was stunned because they were singing the ancient Orthodox hymns, which are like 1,700 years old, with the African rhythms from the traditional, I mean, and it was, it was very pure theologically, but it was the musical traditions. Of, these were all African Kenyans with me in the church, and I have to say it was really stunning. Mm -hmm. I almost wanted to import it here. But, but, but they're at a risk. They're at a risk because they don't have a Koran, they don't have the Upanishads, they don't have the Bible, they don't have, they don't have a hierarchy that's, and funding and all that. And, and that's not going to... To be very frank with you, change. It's not going to change. I don't see it. You know, just, just to underline what you said, uh, Andrew, uh, Abel Alir, who was a, a very prominent leader from the south of Sudan, was commenting to me once about how there are many families in the south of Sudan where uh, some family members are Muslim, some are Christian, and others are African traditionalists. 
And he says, and what makes it work? They get along just fine, no problems at all. It's because uh, they all share a common denominator of that African traditionalist on which the, either the Muslim or the Christian implant is uh, superimposed. And, and while they may go to church on Sunday to get that block checked uh, Tuesday evening, they're you know, doing their African traditionalist thing. Yes. So, yes. so uh, in many ways, it's the glue that binds. Ellen, is there anything you want to comment here at the end well, of the conference? Well, I'd like to believe in the age of globalization with people with greater capacity to rediscover some older traditions that there would be more of a capacity of indigenous communities that are motivated to go back and try to capture, record. I mean, we know at the Library of Congress that there's, you know, the capacity to sort of create out of oral traditions, some to, to create a record that can then be shared and distributed. So I don't think it's beyond, use technology, use communications means um, to create those records. It may not be a great book of 2,000 years ago, but it can still be something, if it's meaningful to a mm -hmm. distinct community, there's ways to make sure that it doesn't get lost. Thank you.